Section 16 of Letters of Pliny by Pliny the Younger Translated by William Melmoth Revised by F. C. T. Bosenkay This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrew Coleman Letters 106 to 110 Letter 106 to Lupicus I said once, and I think not inaptly, of a certain orator of the present age whose compositions are extremely regular and correct but deficient in grandeur and embellishment his only fault is that he has none whereas he who is possessed of the true spirit of oratory should be bold and elevated and sometimes even flame out be hurried away and frequently tread upon the brink of a precipice for danger is generally near whatever is towering and exalted the plain it is true affords a safer but for that reason a more humble and inglorious path they who run are more likely to stumble than they who creep but the latter gain no honour by not slipping, while the former even fall with glory. It is with eloquence, as with some other arts. She is never more pleasing than when she risks most. Have you not observed what acclamations our rope-dancers excite at the instant of imminent danger? Whatever is most entirely unexpected or as the greeks more strongly express it whatever is most perilous most excites our admiration the pilot's skill is by no means equally proved in a calm as in a storm in the former case he tamely enters the port unnoticed and unapplauded but when the cordage cracks the mast bends and the rudder groans then it is that he shines out in all his glory, and is hailed as little inferior to a sea-god. The reason of my making this observation is, because if I mistake not, you have marked some passages in my writings for being tumid, exuberant, and overwrought, which, in my estimation, are but adequate to the thought, or boldly sublime but it is material to consider whether your criticism turns upon such points as are real faults, or only striking and remarkable expressions. Whatever is elevated is sure to be observed, but it requires a very nice judgment to distinguish the bounds between true and false grandeur, between loftiness and exaggeration. To give an instance out of Homer, the author who can, with the greatest propriety, fly from one extreme of style to another. Heaven in loud thunder bids the trumpet sound, and wide beneath them groans the rending ground. Again, reclined on clouds his steed and armour lay. So in this passage, as torrents roll, increased by numerous rills, with rage impetuous down their echoing hills, rushed to the vales, and poured along the plain, roar through a thousand channels to the main. It requires, I say, the nicest balance to poise these metaphors, and determine whether they are incredible and meaningless, or majestic and sublime not that i think anything which i have written or can write admits of comparison with these i am not quite so foolish but what i would be understood to contend for is that we should give eloquence free rein and not restrain the force and impetuosity of genius within too narrow a compass but it will be said perhaps that one law applies to orators another to poets, as if, in truth, Mark Tully were not as bold in his metaphors as any of the poets. But not to mention particular instances from him, in a point where, I imagine, there can be no dispute. Does Demosthenes himself, 
that model and standard of true oratory, does Demosthenes check and repress the fire of his indignation in that well-known passage which begins thus, these wicked men, these flatterers, and these destroyers of mankind, etc. And again, it is neither with stones nor bricks that I have fortified this city, etc. And afterwards, I have thrown up these outworks before Attica, and pointed out to you all the resources which human prudence can suggest, etc. And in another place, O Athenians, I swear by the immortal gods that he is intoxicated with the grandeur of his own actions, etc. But what can be more daring and beautiful than that long digression which begins in this manner a terrible disease? The following passage likewise, though somewhat shorter, is equally boldly conceived. Then it was I rose up in opposition to the daring Pytho, who poured forth a torrent of menaces against you, etc. The subsequent stricture is of the same stamp. When a man has strengthened himself, as Philip has, in avarice and wickedness, the first pretense, the first false step, be it ever so inconsiderable, has overthrown and destroyed all, etc. So in the same style with the foregoing is this, railed off, as it were, from the privileges of society, by the concurrent and just judgments of the three tribunals in the city, and in the same place, O Aristogiton, you have betrayed that mercy which used to be shown to offences of this nature, or rather, indeed, you have wholly destroyed it. In vain, then, would you fly for refuge to a port, which you have shut up and encompassed with rocks. He has said before, I am afraid, therefore, you should appear in the judgment of some to have erected a public seminary of faction, for there is a weakness in all wickedness which renders it apt to betray itself. And a little lower, I see none of these resources open to him, but all is precipice gulf and profound abyss. And again, nor do I imagine that our ancestors erected those courts of judicature, that men of his character should be planted there, but on the contrary eradicated, that none may emulate their evil actions. And afterwards, if he is then the artificer of every wickedness, if he only makes it his trade and traffic, etc. And a thousand other passages which I might cite to the same purpose, not to mention those expressions which Aeschines calls not words but wonders. You will tell me, perhaps, I have unwarily mentioned Aeschines, since Demosthenes is condemned even by him for running into these figurative expressions. But observe, I entreat you, how far superior the former orator is to his critic, and superior too in the very passage to which he objects, for in others the force of his genius, in those above quoted, its loftiness, makes itself manifest. But does Aeschines himself avoid those errors which he reproves in Demosthenes? The orator, says he, Athenians and the law ought to speak the same language, but when the voice of the law declares one thing, and that of the orator another, we should give our vote to the justice of the law, not to the impudence of the orator. And in another place, he afterwards manifestly discovered the design he had, of concealing his fraud under cover of the decree having expressly declared therein that the ambassadors sent to the Oritae gave the five talents not to you, but to Callias, and that you may be convinced of the truth of what I say, after having stripped the decree of its galleys, its trim and its arrogant ostentation, the clause itself. And in another part, suffer him not to break cover and escape out of the limits of the question. 
a metaphor he is so fond of that he repeats it again but remaining firm and confident in the assembly drive him into the merits of the question and observe well how he doubles is his style more reserved and simple when he says but you are ever wounding our ears and are more concerned in the success of your daily harangues than for the salvation of the city what follows is conceived in a yet higher strain of metaphor will you not expel this man as the common calamity of greece will you not seize and punish this pirate of the state who sails about in quest of favourable conjunctures etc with many other passages of a similar nature and now i expect you will make the same attacks upon certain expressions in this letter as you did upon those i have been endeavouring to defend the rudder that groans, and the pilot compared to a sea-god, will not, I imagine, escape your criticism. For I perceive, while I am suing for indulgence to my former style, I have fallen into the same kind of figurative diction which you condemn. But attack them, if you please, provided you will immediately appoint a day when we may meet to discuss these matters in person. You will then either teach me to be less daring, or I shall teach you to be more bold. Farewell. Letter 107 To Caninius I have met with a story which, although authenticated by undoubted evidence, looks very like fable and would afford a worthy field for the exercise of so exuberant lofty and truly poetical a genius as your own it was related to me the other day over the dinner-table where the conversation happened to run upon various kinds of marvels the person who told the story was a man of unsuspected veracity but what has a poet to do with truth However, you might venture to rely upon his testimony, even though you had the character of a faithful historian to support. There is in Africa a town called Hippo, situated not far from the sea coast. It stands upon a navigable lake, communicating with an estuary in the form of a river, which alternately flows into the lake, or into the ocean, according to the ebb and flow of the tide people of all ages amuse themselves here with fishing sailing or swimming especially boys whom love of play brings to the spot with these it is a fine and manly achievement to be able to swim the furthest and he that leaves the shore and his companions at the greatest distance gains the victory it happened in one of these trials of skill, that a certain boy, bolder than the rest, launched out towards the opposite shore. He was met by a dolphin, who sometimes swam before him, and sometimes behind him, then played round him, and at last took him upon his back, and set him down, and afterwards took him up again, and thus he carried the poor frightened fellow out into the deepest part when immediately he turns back again to the shore, and lands him among his companions. The fame of this remarkable accident spread through the town, and crowds of people flocked round the boy, whom they viewed as a kind of prodigy, to ask him questions, and hear him relate the story. The next day the shore was thronged with spectators, all attentively watching the ocean, and, what indeed is almost itself an ocean, the lake. Meanwhile, the boy swam as usual, and among the rest, the boy I am speaking of, went into the lake, but with more caution than before. The dolphin appeared again, and came to the boy, who, together with his companions, swam away with the utmost precipitation. The dolphin, as though to invite and call them back, leaped and dived up and down in a series of circular movements 
This he practised the next day, the day after, and for several days together, till the people, accustomed from their infancy to the sea, began to be ashamed of their timidity. They ventured, therefore, to advance nearer, playing with him and calling him to them, while he, in return, suffered himself to be touched and stroked. Use rendered them courageous. The boy, in particular, who first made the experiment, swam by the side of him, and leaping upon his back was carried backwards and forwards in that manner, and thought the dolphin knew him and was fond of him, while he too had grown fond of the dolphin. There seemed now, indeed, to be no fear on either side. The confidence of the one and the tameness of the other mutually increasing, the rest of the boys in the meanwhile, surrounding and encouraging their companion. It is very remarkable that this dolphin was followed by a second, which seemed only as a spectator and attendant on the former, for he did not at all submit to the same familiarities as the first, but only escorted him backwards and forwards, as the boys did their comrade. But what is further surprising, and no less true than what I have already related, is that this dolphin, who thus played with the boys and carried them upon his back, would come upon the shore, dry himself in the sand, and, as soon as he grew warm, roll back into the sea. It is a fact that Octavius Avitus, deputy governor of the province, actuated by an absurd piece of superstition, poured some ointment over him as he lay on the shore, the novelty and smell of which made him retire into the ocean, and it was not till several days after that he was seen again, when he appeared dull and languid. However, he recovered his strength and continued his usual playful tricks. All the magistrates round flocked hither to view this sight, whose arrival and prolonged stay was an additional expense, which the slender finances of this little community would ill afford. Besides, the quiet and retirement of the place was utterly destroyed. It was thought proper, therefore, to remove the occasion of this concourse by privately killing the poor dolphin. And now, with what a flow of tenderness will you describe this affecting catastrophe? And how will your genius adorn and heighten this moving story? Though, indeed, the subject does not require any fictitious embellishments, it will be sufficient to describe the actual facts of the case without suppression or diminution. Farewell. Letter 108 to Fuscus You want to know how I portion out my day in my summer villa at Tuscum. I get up just when I please, generally about sunrise, often earlier, but seldom later than this. I keep the shutters closed, as darkness and silence wonderfully promote meditation. Thus free and abstracted from these outward objects which dissipate attention, I am left to my own thoughts nor suffer my mind to wander with my eyes, but keep my eyes in subjection to my mind, which, when they are not distracted by a multiplicity of external objects, see nothing but what the imagination represents to them. If I have any work in hand, this is the time I choose for thinking it out, word for word, even to the minutest accuracy of expression. In this way, I compose more or less, according as the subject is more or less difficult, and I find myself able to retain it. I then call my secretary, and opening the shutters, dictate to him what I have put into shape, after which I dismiss him, then call him in again, and again dismiss him. About ten or eleven o'clock, for I do not observe one fixed hour, According to the weather, I either walk upon my terrace or in the covered portico, and there I continue to meditate or dictate what remains upon the subject in which I am engaged. This completed, I get into my chariot, 
where I employ myself as before, when I was walking, or in my study, and find this change of scene refreshes and keeps up my attention. On my return home, I take a little nap, then a walk, and after that repeat out loud and distinctly some Greek or Latin speech, not so much for the sake of strengthening my voice as my digestion, though indeed the voice at the same time is strengthened by this practice. I then take another walk, am anointed, do my exercises, and go into the bath. At supper, if I have only my wife or a few friends with me, some ortho is read to us, and after supper we are entertained either with music or an interlude. When that is finished, I take my walk with my family, among whom I am not without some scholars. Thus we pass our evenings in varied conversation, and the day, even when at the longest, steals imperceptibly away. Upon some occasions I change the order in certain of the articles above mentioned. For instance, if I have studied longer or walked more than usual, after my second sleep, and reading a speech or two aloud, instead of using my chariot, I get on horseback, by which means I ensure as much exercise, and lose less time. The visits of my friends from the neighbouring villages claim some part of the day, and sometimes, by an agreeable interruption, they come in very seasonably to relieve me when I am feeling tired. I now and then amuse myself with hunting, but always take my tablets into the field, that, if I should meet with no game, I may at least bring home something. Part of my time, too, though not so much as they desire, is allotted to my tenants, whose rustic complaints, along with these city occupations, make my literary studies still more delightful to me. Farewell. Letter 109. To Paulinus. As you are not of a disposition to expect from your friends the ordinary ceremonial observances of society, when they cannot observe them without inconvenience to themselves, so I love you too steadfastly to be apprehensive of your taking otherwise than I wish you should, my not waiting upon you on the first day of your entrance upon the consular office especially as I am detained here by the necessity of letting my farms upon long leases. I am obliged to enter upon an entirely new plan with my tents, for under the former leases, though I made them very considerable abatements, they have run greatly in arrear. For this reason several of them have not only taken no sort of care to lessen a debt which they found themselves incapable of wholly discharging, but have even seized and consumed all the produce of the land, in the belief that it would now be of no advantage to themselves to spare it. I must, therefore, obviate this increasing evil, and endeavour to find out some remedy against it. The only one I can think of is, not to reserve my rent in money, but in kind, and so place some of my servants to overlook the tillage, and guard the stock, as indeed there is no sort of revenue more agreeable to reason than what arises from the bounty of the soil, the seasons, and the climate. It is true this method will require great honesty, sharp eyes, and many hands. However, I must risk the experiment, and, as in an inveterate complaint, try every change of remedy. You see, it is not any pleasurable indulgence that prevents my attending you on the first day of your consulship. I shall celebrate it, nevertheless, as much as if I were present, and pay my vows for you here, with all the warmest tokens of joy and congratulation. Farewell. Letter 110 To Fuscus you are much pleased, I find, 
with the account I gave you in my former letter of how I spend the summer season at Tuscum, and desire to know what alteration I make in my method when I am at Laurentum in the winter. None at all, except abridging myself of my sleep at noon, and borrowing a good piece of the night before daybreak and after sunset for study. And if business is very urgent, which in winter very frequently happens, instead of having interludes or music after supper, I reconsider whatever I have previously dictated, and improve my memory at the same time by this frequent mental revision. Thus I have given you a general sketch of my mode of life in summer and winter, to which you may add the intermediate seasons of spring and autumn, in which, while losing nothing out of the day, I gain but little from the night. Farewell. End of section 16